Good morning and welcome to worship this Sunday on this beautiful day that the Lord has given us. You are all welcome here. We are all welcome here. We're invited by God. So we come in worship, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Will you join me in our responsive call to worship? On this day, which is holy, we gather not alone, but as Christ's body. As one who is coming together, we gather. On this day of wonder and hope, we gather not in isolation, but in community. As those who would care for one another, we gather. On this day of prayer and praise, of silence and song, we gather not with empty hands or emptier hearts. As those baptized in grace's tears, we gather. Hello and good morning to everyone. For our opening hymn today, I want to invite you to sing When Love is Found. This is number 316 on your hymnals, 316. And we're going to be singing verses 1 to 3. Please join me in the call to reconciliation. I'm sorry. Who can really see their own mistakes? Are there hidden faults that we can't acknowledge? Do we seek to separate ourselves from certain people? Together, let us examine ourselves and hope that we can be open to the leading of the spirit. And now please uh, join me with the unison prayer of brokenness. Sometimes God, we do not know what to confess. We seek to keep your law, but the right course is not always clear. We want to follow your direction, but it is hard to discern what is true. Sometimes it is difficult to care about people whose values are different from ours. How can we be one with those who do not share our beliefs? At times our own faith is shaken, our faith in ourselves and our faith in you. We need your help, God, so our sins will not have power over us. Amen. Join me in our words of assurance. God's spirit is upon us, that spirit of forgiveness, that spirit of grace, that spirit of unity with all people. Today, in all the days to come, today and in all the days to come, 
God's spirit is with us. Thanks be to the one who is our joy, our strength, our hope. Praise God. We are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> As Jesus read your words so long ago, almighty God, we too come to your words with hope and expectation. May we hear the message you want us to hear. Amen. Hear now these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Jesus returned to Galilee, powerful in the spirit. News that he was back spread through the countryside. He taught in their meeting places to everyone's acclaim and pleasure. He came to Nazareth, where he had been reared. As he always did on the Sabbath, he went to the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him. Then he started in. You've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. Jesus has returned to his hometown. You know what that's like. All the guys named Joseph are suddenly called Joey. All the football stars are treated to a walk down memory lane about that amazing touchdown after the clock ran down. The troublemaker is reminded of all his escapades. There have been countless songs and poems and stories written about going home, either successfully or not. John Mellencamp sang about coming home to his small town. No, I cannot forget where it is that I come from. I cannot forget the people who love me. Yeah, I can be myself here in this small town and people let me be just what I want to be. But do they? Jesus is doing just that, coming home to his small town. All his neighbors and friends and family and Hebrew school instructors and rabbis are sitting in the pews. All the people who saw Jesus grow up from a young boy to a man. What high expectations, what assumptions. We know this guy, they say. They lean forward in their seats, curious of what he'll have to say today. They remember him when. I remember being a student pastor in my home church and facing some of these same feelings. The first time I stood up to preach in front of my own small town was nothing if not daunting. While many cheered me on, several of my closest friends weren't convinced. I saw the skepticism in their eyes as they sat there. The people closest to us can be our biggest critics. It's no different for Jesus. There's a ton of history in that room. Jesus carefully takes the scroll, an action done thousands of times before by other men, and he unrolls it, the scroll, of the book of Isaiah. And he finds a place where he wants to read chapter 61 in the book of Isaiah verses one and two. And he recites this, God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. This passage from Isaiah would have been very familiar to the listeners. They all waited. The expectation was that he would read a piece of scripture and then share his thoughts, a sort of reflection on what Isaiah would have meant by those words. This was how it was done, rabbis taught. The people listening that day expected to be taught. 
But then when Jesus is done, when he has rolled up the scroll and returned it to its holy spot, he sits down and says, you've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. Wait, what? That's it? That's all he has for us? That's when those in attendance start looking around at one another. That's when the foot shuffling and the quiet coughing and the clearing of throats begins. We had heard such great things about this Nazarene son of ours. We had high hopes. Jesus, unlike some of the other rabbis they have heard, is not willing to give them an account of the law or an historical account or a plan for some far off time. He simply states that today's the day when scripture is fulfilled. Everything you have heard has come down to this moment, Jesus says. He gives them all they will need to live out the commands of God today. At this moment, in this place, he is the one to bring the message and bring it he does. Pardon the prisoners, give sight to the blind, set the burdened free. Simple, right? Jesus, in his simple response of, you've just heard scripture make history, it came true just now in this place, is making things painfully clear, if anyone is listening. He's the son of God, and his mission is for all of us. It's amazing how a few words can change everything. But here's the thing. I'm pretty sure that the folks sitting in the pews that day weren't looking for a job to do. They were wanting to hear about a rescue, a change to their situation, a new beginning. They wanted a fairer society, a less tyrannical government, less discrimination. Sound familiar? A lot of the same things that we want. And they were wondering what was going to be done for them. They assumed, as we often do, that it was about them. And if this Jesus, who they have known since he was a kid, was the one to announce the rescue, the change, the new beginning, then that was okay with them. But that's not exactly what Jesus does. He says to them, I am the son of God, and this is my mission, and you are the ones to help bring about that mission. You are the ones to live out the prophet's words, not someone else, you. And not tomorrow, but today. So often we get stuck pining for the past or dreaming of the future. And in the midst of that dreaming, we lose today. Jesus's words are a rebuttal to that dreaming. Today is the day I am the one, you are the one. Are you listening, he says? Are we listening, he asks? It was a harsh reality to find out that things weren't just going to get better when Jesus, the knight, rode into town and did his magic. Don't you think we still have a little bit of that desire to just let God fix things? But today we are reminded that this just isn't God's way to fix things for us. Don't you hate when someone tells you it's your job to fix things? It's your job to get your hands dirty. Don't you hate when someone tells you to stop whining and get up and do something to change the situation that is making you unhappy or angry or miserable? Whether in our own life or in our community or in our world, don't you hate when complaining isn't your only job? I loved Laura's plea about the Peace and Justice Committee this past week. She asked, are you tired of sitting on the sidelines and talking back to your TV when you see injustice? Join the Peace and Justice Committee and be an advocate for change. Jesus would say amen to that. There are times when we need to be taken care of. There is no denying that. But there are more times when we need to get up and be the change we want. The change in our lives, in our communities, and in our world. Jesus declares that this is the moment to act today.
He points out that he's only asking of us what he is willing to do himself. Jesus is only asking us to live in the ways that he's willing to live. Are we willing? Jesus, the guy who gives himself over to every hurting human being, the guy who stands up to that tyrannical government, Jesus, the guy who cares for people who don't even know him, the guy who dies for us all. That's the guy we're supposed to emulate. The words that Jesus reads that day sound remarkably similar to the ones that Mary sings when she finds out that she is pregnant with the Messiah. A song she must have sung to Jesus as she was rocking him to sleep at night or nursing him during the day. A song about a good and gracious God who has brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly and filled the hungry with good things. But also a song that takes responsibility for being a part of that change a song that Jesus made the theme of his entire ministry. And like it or not, my friends, it is our song as well, if we are willing to sing it. In my last church, we hosted a community meal each week. It was an amazing two hours of food and fellowship offered to the neighborhood and the church. And what we found was while the food fed people, the fellowship was what they craved. The simple meal was literally the weekly highlight for many of the people who came each Wednesday night. And yet sometimes there would still be a person sitting all alone, even if only briefly. One week as I was serving up the pasta, I watched one of our church members go to a few tables and lean down and whisper to the people sitting there. Then I watched as those people stood up with their dinner and moved over to her table. She was inviting anyone who was sitting alone to come and share a meal with her and her family and others at her table. I watched this quiet living out of the gospel, this caring for the lonely, this welcoming of the stranger, this risk of rejection. I have to believe Jesus would have approved. When Jesus quietly sat down that day after sharing only a brief reflection, the room went quiet. I imagine just like us, they wondered if they were willing and able to sing the song that had been sung by Isaiah, by Mary, by Jesus, by countless others before them. The song of love and grace offered to the world in response to the love and grace offered to us all. So the question is, are you willing to continue to sing that song? It's not clear what will be asked of you, but it won't always be comfortable or easy. In fact, I'll guarantee that. And you may say, Pastor Dawn, you said that same thing last week to us. And I did say that same thing last week. Now, following Jesus often requires sacrifice and discomfort, that it often requires less planning and more trusting that it often means leaving behind something that feels easy and comfortable and is known for something that makes our stomach hurt and is a big, risky unknown. I say it all again this week because there is not a more important message to remember. That we are part of the change, my friends, and that the change will be anything but easy and comfortable. Welcome to the gospel. Jesus' recitation needs to awaken us from our dreamy, inattentive selves. Listen again as he reads. The Spirit of God is on me and therefore also on you. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor and therefore you. He sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. Yes, you too to set the burden and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act, to act now, all of us. Living out God's promise and commission and command is not about yesterday or even about tomorrow, it's about today. This is a hard truth that most of us don't want to hear. It calls us to act, to move and to take responsibility. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him intent. 
Then he started in, you've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. A song that is sung yesterday, today, and tomorrow by anyone with a willing voice. Amen. Let us pray. God of the song, give us your words to sing to the world, words of hope, of love, of grace, words to sustain and bring about change, words that matter. The time is right now. We are the people that you challenge. Amen. Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing till the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Jesus, Jesus, how I love thee. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing to the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing to the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. Jesus, Jesus, how I love thee. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing to the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Sing to the power of the Lord come down. Shout hallelujah, praise his holy name. Holy Jesus, praise his name. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, praise his, his holy name. name. Hallelujah, Holy Jesus, praise his name. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, praise his holy name. Hallelujah, Jesus, praise his name. Hallelujah, Lord, praise his holy name. Praise his name. Praise his holy name, praise his name, oh, oh, praise his holy name, praise his name, praise his holy name, praise his name, oh, oh, praise his holy name, praise his name, praise his holy name, praise his name, oh, oh, praise his holy name, praise his name. Praise his holy name, praise his name, oh, oh, praise his holy name, praise him! That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Oh. Let's take some time, if we could, to, uh, to gather some joys and concerns and prayers that are on our hearts this week. I have a couple that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And 
for our closing hymn, we're going to be singing Glorious Things of the Are Spoken, number 286, and we're going to be singing verses 1 and 2, and then we will come back to part of verse 4. This is number 286. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We'll take some time to uh, to join together in fellowship if you if you're able to stay for a few moments and just catch us up on how things are going for you in this interesting crazy time that we are living. But now as you go into this week, know that you are held and that you are loved, but also know that you are inspired to be something amazing for God. Go, serve, love, offer grace to those who need it the most, knowing that you are held as well. Amen and amen.